Okay, so I wasn't here last week. Task. <laughs> hi, hi, Kristen. Hi, Marina. I sorry. I like last week. I was supposed to record, and I had a snag, so I was just setting up the screen recording. Okay. And Paul, it. I did a test run, so I don't think I'll have a problem with it this go time. Go for it. Go for it. Um, so, so I just learned, Marina. I couldn't yeah. hear you when you introduced yourself. Apparently, I was too far away from you, so I've learned oh. how a little bit about this space, but oh, because I didn't hear anything. Who was speaking last? Paul said. <laughs> the three of you. The three of you are okay. Right? Yeah. You're good. Yeah. And you know, you, you go to the article by clicking on the poster in the center. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're clicking on where it says click here to comment, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And that'll take directly to. No comment. Yeah. yeah. And the specific exactly. section, too. And I see 44 to 67. So yes. Right. And we go ahead and make comments. Mm hmm. If you're terribly familiar with the article, which Chris, <laughs> right, you might spend some time like seeing what other people are saying and replying so that, you know, there is a role to play there too. But in that section, in the mode and meaning section.
All right. Did you all get a chance to talk to each other? <laughs> no, I think we were reading. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so um, maybe refer to the questions that are up on the wall above and think about what you want to ask Sam um, after he reads one blog post that he's going to read. Um, and then he, you're going to come back here and he's going to float around and you're going to talk to him about it. Okay. Like, so we're going to think about these questions based on a post that he picks. That's right. That and means. based already based on what you've seen. Mm -hmm. And you, you have 30 seconds to get that together. <laughs> we want you to do it kind of quickly, but, and then come back to the large group and then you'll come back here with his in mind. Yep. Gotcha. I think. <laughs> so these questions are just the same questions that come out of the article that we read. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing it through the, the lines we were reading. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, um, the overlap between the other um, boxes is kind of between there. We didn't read it in this section. It's later in the article. Oh, Oh, here they come. <laughs> Sam is ready to read and people are flying back to the to the center stage. If you okay. please come on over. Yeah, tell me when. Oh, uh, I think he's. Did we lose Paul? I think he's coming. But anyway, F F FYI, when I wrote this piece, I shared it with my wife, and she was like, "Yo, Sam, you're gonna get us in trouble." <laughs> I'm like, "No, nah, sweetheart. Uh, you know, this uh, the light is the best disinfectant. You know." <laughs> Like good trouble. Yeah, this was a good trouble piece. Mm -hmm. But I was super compelled to write it after reading the book. And I listened to it and I heard about it on a pod. Of course, I heard about it. on Not of course, but I heard about the book on the podcast. Which led me to read it. And then I, I just couldn't put it down and I just could not share. Okay, Sam, we are all here. Let's, um, if you want to see it at the same time, and you probably do, uh, click on the dollar bill and you'll go to it. <laughs> oh, it'll, it'll all right. open up, it'll open up a different link. I mean, a different tab. Um, yeah, tell me when to start. I think we're here. We, okay. I think we are. Yep. Go for it. All right. I, uh, IRS, please read me a letter book review, whiteness of wealth, how the tax system impoverishes black Americans and how we can fix it. Dear Dorothy A. Brown, a tech, as tax season comes to an end, there's no better time to prepare for any future financial battles with the IRS. If I were to hire a tax auditor or lawyer, I would choose you, Dorothy A. Brown. After reading your book, The Whiteness of Wealth, How the Tax System Impoverishes Black Americans and How We Can Fix It, there's no doubt in my mind that you are who I would need on my side to file a tax complaint against the IRS. 
I've helped my mother and grandmother do their taxes, just like you did your parents, James and Dottie Brown's taxes. Anyone else who reads your book would certainly agree with me that you, Dorothy, are exactly the tax and legal expert someone would need on their side to expose racism in the American tax system, taxation system. Your book, The Whiteness of Wealth, is a powerful and groundbreaking read. Your book displays your strong understanding of how racial inequity is built right into the core of American society, the financial system. Your book gives a deep dive into the tax code with incisive data. Your commentary on how race is baked into the wealth disparity into wealth disparities in America touches close to home for me and I'm sure many other readers. As a child who grew up in a single parent household headed by my mother, Lizzie Reed, who relied heavily on support from my from Ruby and Ab Smith, my grandmother and grandfather, I realized early on that a working or middle class lifestyle was not really a likely path towards creating wealth. As a child, my mind told me that I would be better off being either extremely clueless and poor or filthy rich. Now that I'm older, this book has been an eye-opening read that gives insight into how racism limits so many bl black Americans financially. While reading, I found it quite interesting to learn as a result of your childhood observation of police brutality and educational inequities, you chose a career in accounting and the taxes to avoid the complications of race. I think growing up black in America makes us look at many, looks at many, I'm sorry, at money and finances in different ways. Getting back to why I chose you, why I would choose you as my auditor or tax lawyer, it's because of your in-depth knowledge and powerful arguments about how racism is embedded in our financial, in Americans' financial system. I do believe that your book offers the right tools to challenge any policymaker who may argue that racism is not encoded in the IRS tax code and that the American social structures in general. Chapters such as Married While Black, Black House, White Market, and The Great Unequalizers provide powerful data, facts, and arguments that would make a great legal defense in the fight against the racism embedded in the tax code. Coupled with the compelling argu argumentative narratives, your book is a powerful look into, into how the tax code needs to be overhauled in order to provide economic justice for, for all. It is a powerful defense against the claim that there's no racism in the American financial system. I appreciate how in the chapter Married While Black, we meet Henry and Charlene Seaborn and learn the origins of the loophole for married people filing joint taxes. Joint, a joint tax status. You note that up until World War II, only the richest Americans paid taxes. In your book, Mr. Seaborn, the vice president of a shipping company, used his privilege to reach the Supreme Court and get the IRS to reduce taxes for the wealthiest Americans. In this chapter, we readers learn that the progressive tax system is actually extremely regressive for, for any black household, for many black households. The system puts cash in the pockets of most white married couples while it takes money out of the pockets of most black married couples. Another thought I had while reading your book is that it does an excellent job exposing some of the darkest parts of the American financial system. In your book, you remind me of Dorothy from The Wiz. You simply ease on down the road and uncover the reality behind the facade. The facade. Your book uncovers the vestiges of redlining and racial discrimination that leaves so many black homeowners holding homes that are depreciating in value far beyond the homes owned by white homeowners. I compare you to Dorothy in The Wiz because in The Whiteness of Wealth, you pull back the curtains and help readers see that the tax code disfavors, disfavors blacks in the areas of education, labor, and legacy building. As a teacherpreneur and lifelong hustler, I really appreciate insights on how black taxpayers can take on a defensive stance in the tax game. You emphasize the importance of building stock investment portfolio, uh, 
building a stock investment portfolio as a hedge against racialized impact of marriage, housing, employment practices, and policies. I believe that anyone seeking to understand why the tax policy matters needs to read your book. I have one last question for you, Dorothy. Do you think your next book will be titled The Blackness of Wealth to show the counter moves black folks make to combat and overcome the unjust economic system that we've inherited? If more people read your book and take with them the important message and information you're giving, that could barely be a possibility. We can also hope that the IRS commissioner and lawmakers read your powerful book, something certainly needs to change. We all deserve racial and economic equality, and those two things certainly go hand in hand. Best read, AKA Samuel Reed III. Yay. <laughs> oh, we're, we're snapping, so we're, okay. Cool, Sam, Sam, th thank you, thank you, thank you for reading that, um, it, it really helps us. Um, I, the, the hard thing that um, we're gonna ask Sam to do now is um, to float from group to group. And then when he shows up at your group, you'll be able to ask the maker questions. So what we wanna do now is have a conversation. We want you to assess, not, not uh, would you say earlier, Chris, you said something about, <laughs> it's not judge, but assess this work. Um, keep, keep your assessment focused on this one post that you just heard in light of the questions that are up on the wall in your domain. Okay, I think that's clear. Uh, so fly back to your domain and Sam, don't start at the blue group, yeah, start, no, start at the green group. Okay. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Hey, Sam. Hey, hey. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. This is this is such a cool fishbowl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to read the book now. So your post has definitely made me do that. Um, I'm sure that Marina and Harry have questions, but I've got like this burning question that I want to ask about mode, um, which kind of leads. It's, it's actually about genre, too. So I noticed that you start with the image that you took from Unsplash and then you wrote a letter. So could you just talk a little bit about why those two choices? Say the first. The fr I missed the first part about the un you start you start the post with an image from unsplash um, oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then and then you go into a letter um, genre so could you talk a little bit about why those two choices yeah uh, so the image you know because I, I didn't I think I didn't want to use people because that was just gonna like create a different kind of response so like using uh, currency I thought was 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 just a useful kind of more tasteful choice um because you know i could have like put some white folks up there and like made it some corny you know i don't know but i just that wasn't that wasn't what i was going for but the letter format was intentional um actually i've been intentionally using letters as a form of doing book reviews because i want to really speak to the authors and so I read the book, of course, I don't know. Anyway, if you've seen my other posts, I, I read this book, which had a real profound impact on me, Letters to wow. Sons in Society. And it was written in letter forms. And so me and my students, we got engaged in like letter forming. We did a, a Black Wall Street uh, response where we did letter forms as well. And so that that format is just super accessible, but it's also like, I can do this book review maybe in a way that I'm feeling more connected to the authors as opposed to just doing a, a academic review of a book. That makes a lot of sense. Did you decide to start with an image for a particular reason? Well, the, um, it's encouraged in the medium post to kind of use, oh. you know, but, but yeah, I, I don't know. If, yeah, no. It's like 101 of blog posting. If you have an image, it'll go further, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like okay. I said, but I purposely chose not to use uh, people. Um, I, I chose to use the uh, image of a, you know, currency. Cool. Thanks. I'll pass it to my green colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, when you, I'm curious about like combining modes because when I'm looking through there, you're comparing, uh, you're comparing her to Dorothy in a whiz, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then you're also comparing her to your personal um, experiences. And you're definitely also combining the mode of first person. So you're combining three different types of writing in one piece, which is interesting. And it breaks every rule that teachers always say, just pick one, one which I think is cool. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because there's conflict. It's interesting because the students are like, well, wait, when I'm in class, I'm always told just to focus on one thing and not three. But what you do is effective. So I was just wondering if you were consciously aware of that. No, but I, I have I have given my students that ability, particularly when they're when you know the rules, you can break them. And so, like if you look in some of our, our youth voice posts, some of the most effective ones are those those ones that are like uh, not following my rules, and they're just doing something different, and it's it's super compelling. Um, Sam, Sam, I know the group down below has some questions for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I want to push you out of this group. I'm, I'm a put, yeah, but the Dorothy. <laughs> I, I did, her name was Dorothy, so I like as I was reading the book, and I like I, I played with that. I, I didn't know if it was going to hit or land, or it was going to be corny. But that's I, fine. I, all right, I'm gonna go check out the other groups, y'all. Thanks. But, but keep talking as as if Sam were here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure that might work. My this is funny. I have kids that are from pretty broken backgrounds um, that we do a summer program with, and they're like very low income, low functioning, just barely getting by. And it's very hard over the summer. We spend all summer with them after school's out, you know, doing instruction all summer with them in a separate program. And uh, the basic skills are very difficult because they latch on to just like, what are the rules? All I want to know is what the rules are. And that's what they want to know because they feel that that's what the teachers have always asked them to do when they go back to school to be successful. So it's interesting to try to figure out where, how to get them to think like um, it's okay to break the rules if you know the rules when all their teachers are just giving them very specific things to follow so they can pass. So it's interesting because you want to, I want to give them the freedom to realize that what they can do with all the different combinations of ways that can be effective. But it's very difficult when most of those students are just like, look, I that's cool, but I just want to know the rules so that I can pass the class. So they're like latching onto basic survival skills still, you know? So it's interesting because it is a different way of looking at writing and, you know, literature and analyzing and thinking, which is a better way, I think, but it's very difficult to have them navigate that as well as navigate the field of trying to just get by and making sure they're successful based on what a teacher defines as successful in the classroom. Yeah. It's interesting. It's That's why I love the conversation with writers. It's like I have so many questions for Sam, mm -hmm. and I wonder a lot about his choices in this piece because of the generation he is, right? So it's actually a very traditionally written piece, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. He had so many opportunities with multimodal composition that he didn't take. So he put that image at the front, but then as I got, as he was reading about Dorothy, I'm like, I totally want to see like a tornado or something. Like I, I want to be taken into that story. But then I realized, oh, it's not about the tornado. It's about pulling back the curtain. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that was good that I had a different image than what he wanted or not. Mm -hmm. Right. And that could be his choice. But then he also mentioned in the, um, the big circle, how he had first heard about this book on the mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, gee, I wonder if he linked that podcast so that I could go listen to it. And he could have easily done that like after the letter and he didn't. So like I have these questions for him, like were those intentional or was that really just like our generation doesn't think that way? Mm -hmm. Whereas your students, Harry, they might right? They might want to speak more in images yeah. and, and, and in links and in things like that. And that doesn't make it wrong. It just might push us as, as assessors to say, hey, maybe this is a, an intentional choice that actually is good for the reader in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just assume that everybody that is of the current generation thinks like that now. Because as soon as I see a word or something, I just like make something of something else. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of those students, I would want 
like every single time that something else might refer to something else, just because that would be something you go back and investigate later. Just because it's, everything is so fast now, but it's always cool to see that there's something overlooked and then somebody can go back and see like, oh, that link, look what that is, that explains it further. Uh, Um, yeah, I was one. Uh, oh. We we want to come back and have some interconnected time, so please come back to the large group. Okay. This is this is workshop as choreography. That's really speed dating. Sorry. It is. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say really quickly because I didn't get to ask Sam too. I I really love that he um, read it aloud for us, and that just made me think about. Um, I guess similar to just um, Kristen, what you were sharing about like that inclusion of the audio recorded voice and the impacts that I was reading along as he was yeah. reading it aloud. And it just like his voice too, it just made the words come even more alive. Um, yeah. well, for me, I think I paid even more attention to it yeah, um, I, by I, having I, his voice there. Good point. All right. We're coming. Okay, Paul, sorry. We're coming. Sorry. <laughs> Also, we see like a little bit of auto ethnography in there. If you're building in that, so that that narrative, your narrative doesn't get in the way there. You know, somebody else who may come in and not understand multimodal com composition or pre not maybe understand isn't the right word, but uh, fully appreciate would probably say, you know, this this narrative piece in the middle is kind of getting in the way, right? It's me, 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 and myself into the into the composition, and without that, me, me, me in the composition, then we lose, uh, we lose the voice in that particular piece. It, it was important. There's an important reader to author connection that you made there. So uh, we're, just we're, ask, we're asking Sam to um, not respond in this round. Um, and please keep your comments somewhat uh, concise, um, so we can get around to everybody. Um, but jump in. Thank you for getting us started, Paul. It's just what you're thinking now that you want to say to Sam about the work, maybe from the perspective of the domain. <laughs> just anybody, Paul? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Should I call on people? Is it easier? <laughs> it might be. Um, go ahead, Christine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Eva in our group asked Sam to talk about his source, and it was so interesting, you know, or sort of what are some of the similarities or what was he think, you know, in what ways might it compare to Sons of Society, which was one of the sources that he cited. And then Sam talked about the use of figurative lang language and this, and what Paul was just talking about, the sort of per his story within, you know, she shares a lot of her personal story. So he shared a lot of his personal story and, um, and that from sense of society is playing with figurative language and, you know, this connection to um, something like the whiz, you know, like that, what did you say? You felt like it was a little silly, but you wanted to play with it, you know, just to start like how, how far can you stretch this kind of letter genre? So I just thought that was so interesting and I really appreciated um, Eva's questions about you know, about the source and what it what it drew from Sam in that process. Some key points from audience guys. If you're... So um... I really like that Sam used the phrase he wanted to see uh, just kind of piggybacking on what Christina was sharing there. Okay. He wanted to see if it would land. That was the phrase that he used in our group. You know, the yep. figurative language with this land. And I, I love I love that term or that kind of that feel, you know, like sometimes we talk about landing a punch. You know, not just will the figure of language land with somebody by way of meaning, but will it land the blow that uh, we were meaning to uh, uh, affect there? So, right. I, I was hoping to hear from some of the audience. Kristen, Kristen was trying to say something. She might be too. Oh yeah, Kristen, go ahead. Maybe move down. The perfect. There we That's go. Good. Sorry. Go. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. um, no, I was I was saying that um, we had kind of talked about similar things with Sam while he was in the Moden meeting, which shows the overlap of the categories. And I was really trying to adhere to the questions to test them, right, and to see how how we could kind of draw more out of not just Sam but us as readers. 
And so after you left, after Sam left us, um, I asked the question of my fellow readers, like, I wonder whether the choice of mode was in part because of how Sam has been trained to be a writer. So in actuality, he chose an image and he chose a letter, but the bulk of what we read was a letter, which is a pretty traditional mode to write in. And I wondered, you know, as he was reading the first time through when he got to that Dorsey thing, I wanted to like see a tornado because I thought that's where it was going. But then I realized that wasn't actually the image that he was pulling from the Wizard of Oz. So is that a good or bad thing? Like, would it be better to have the image of the curtain so that I knew where he was going? Or is it better to have me kind of snapped with, oh, I'm wrong. My image is wrong, right? Um, and then the other thing that I brought up was he mentioned when we were all together how he, his, he first learned about this book in a podcast. I was like, man, I'd really love to listen to that podcast. And this goes back to the originality and the sourcing of everything. Like, you could have made the choice to link the podcast or link to the book or something like that for your reader to kind of go further. Um, but that wasn't there. And I wonder why. Mm-hmm. So these are just kind of like ways that I might push an author to think even more multimodally um, in questions that I would, would ask. Not that it's right or wrong, just to kind of think through like, well, why did I make these choices and why not? Yeah. Great, great, yeah. Um, Chris, Troy, or Trevor, do you guys have anything you want to add about audience? Do you guys see it? There you go, thanks, Trevor. <laughs> so uh, one of the conversations that we had was, um, Sam, how you sort of built up in your piece towards your point. Um, you didn't kind of like come right out the gate and um, I guess sort of like assert your stance or your position on the topic. It was sort of like a build to that final kind of like end point. Um, and I was kind of wondering, you know, being in the classroom and I'm, you know, I'm sure being a humanities teacher, you have to foster essentially spicy conversations around race, class, Um, gender, culture, um, and all those sort of things. And um, I I could see the deft touch while still taking a firm stand on your position with the way that you engage with the audience, the way that you phrase um, your um, language. So we kind of were appreciating the fact that you were getting across a very clear political point, but doing so in a way that wouldn't sort of contribute to the dumpster fire, you know, discourse that we're kind of having, you know, naturally right now. So regardless of one's political affiliation, by the end, they might disagree with you, but in the beginning, they're not going to get their hackles raised instantly by, you know, keying into a political language that you're using that might, you know, they might disagree with. I think we also touched on the affordances. If you look at the second bullet point of our um, audience thing, how do writers utilize audience interactivity to achieve their writing goals? And I think that last paragraph, there's clearly the goal is like, IRS or politicians should read this book. And so I think we wondered about the possibility of maybe using the affordances of some hyperlinks to the IRS director or your local politician somehow to, you know, to maybe spur them um, to read the book. Did, I was curious, did you all talk about his students as audience? And the only reason I, ask that is because in the conversation about sources, he was also talking about the Black Wall Street work he's doing with his kids in the class, in his classroom, and that they're writing love letters in the classroom. So they're all working on this genre together. And so I was thinking about how he might be modeling also for students, um, like a way of playing with this form or ways of playing with this form. Which reminds me of Paul Hankins' work too, because yeah. it's mentor text as well for his students. But not 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 primarily <laughs> somehow, right? Only secondarily. It kind of becomes mentor text, yeah. 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 Um I, I'm trying to respect time. Um, since I, since you allowed me to push you around um, so much, um, but uh, we want to give Sam last word here, if we can. What are you thinking at this point, Sam? No, this was this was super generous, Paul. You should have told me it felt like this, bro. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you man. mean Paul Hankins? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, you went through this last week. I was just talking about how meta it was, but 
it was beyond meta, like as receiving the feedback. It was also like it was super generative. Um, other, like even as a, even as a like as a writing workshop process, this could, this could have been like a cool writing workshop. Pro- like even say before I I published a piece to have gotten this kind of like a, you know feedback would have like probably like made the piece like even more impactful because you know we often uh, you know with my medium posts i'm just trying to generate content partly to like keep a cadence of writing as a, both as a as a model for my students but also as as for my own brand and my own identity so um i, I super appreciate all the all the uh feedback that i received it was so generative Thank you. Um, any um, sort of, uh, I, we're, we're giving you the last word. Let's stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, on the, and, um, yeah, yeah. There, I was, mean, there, was, there was a link to uh, Dorothy's book in the, in the um, is it medium, the, the links, they're there, but they're like, they're subtle. So. <laughs> All right. Cool. cool. So we're, we're going to do this again next week. I'm not sure what, uh, what we'll use to do that. If anybody wants to volunteer something, let us know. Um, if I please send me notes, thoughts about um, the process. Let's keep honing this a little bit. Um, yes, we could make it an hour and a half long, but then we'll never do it, right? So I'm really interested in doing a process that does all these things, but does does them, you know, in a, in a time frame that. That we can live with. No, you kept the one point, and you did yeah. it gently as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Um, and uh, you know, then everything remains live. This room remains here. The um, the now comment uh, article remains there. You can go there and comment and keep that dialogue going. And we'll see you all around. Talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Paul. Bye.